I'm Bill Fawcett here at Ring of Fire Con, and today we're going to be speaking with Maurice Broadus, one of Indiana's favorite writers. Hi, Mo. Hey, how are you doing, Bill? <laughs> All right. How are things down in Indianapolis? Uh, I gotta say, it's going pretty good right about now. <laughs> I've noticed that. I've noticed that. So, uh, I'm not important, but you are in this conversation. So why don't you give us a little background so the people watching know exactly who you are and what kind of things you're writing? Okay. Uh, well, my name is Maurice Broadus. I am a, a middle school teacher. I am a community organizer, the, the resident Afrofuturist at the, the Kepper Institute. And I am a science fiction and fantasy author. I've written about a dozen books, um, nearly a hundred short stories. Um, and uh, I think that yeah, that, that pretty much covers what, you know, what I've been up to lately, or at least some of it. <laughs> You're also a book doctor. Uh, yes, I've been, uh, I've been a book doctor. I've been an editor. I'm currently the editor, one of the editors over at Apex Magazine. Um, been a consultant on a video game, uh, uh, Watch Dogs 2. So, uh, you know, I keep my hands in a bunch of different pies. <laughs> so you're a middle school teacher and you write a lot of YA. In fact, you've uh, gotten some uh, selections like the Library Guild Gold Selection for your last YA. Yeah. How does it relate to being an author? How does it being a teacher of that same age group affect your writing? Uh, well, for a start, uh, <laughs> it gives my kids something that they can read because, uh, uh, you know, I, I came up as a horror writer and, uh, and and most of my stuff skews more adult. And so, uh, you know, so I, and I've been a middle school teacher for what's this must be like three years now, three, four years now. And, uh, you know, so they, you know, when they find out I'm a writer, they're always like, well, Mr. Broadus, you know, can, can, can we read something of yours? And, you know, then I start thinking through my catalog. Well, let's see, Devil's Marionette, Lead With Me. Orgy of Souls. No, no, I have nothing, <laughs> nothing of mine you can read. Uh, so, uh, so uh, having the opportunity to uh, write the, the usual suspects that, uh, you know, that, that at least solved that problem, you know, and I have something that uh, my middle school students could read. So that's great. That's great. <laughs> How bad a critic are your is your own class? Look, okay. I, I, so two, I got two answers for this. So one, they are impressed by nothing. They're literally impressed by nothing. I could win all the awards, uh, get all the good write-ups, and in the end, I'm still Mr. Broadus. And so, uh, you know, so as far as that goes, you know, no, nothing, no, literally the coolest thing on my resume to them was the fact that I worked on Watch Dogs 2. That's what made me a real writer to them. All the other stuff, you know, the <laughs> books and all that guys, no, 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 that, that doesn't count. But, uh, but Watch Dogs 2, suddenly I had their attention. No, so, for, the reader, for the listeners, Watch Dogs 2 is... Um, it was a, a video game uh, that came out about a couple years ago, and uh, um, it was about a group of uh, a activist hackers um, that ended up doing a lot of violence, oddly enough, but uh, <laughs> as video games do. Uh, but, uh, but that was, that was the, the big thing for, for them, they, my middle school students, that they recognized. Um, and then the other thing, so I just actually... Uh, I just actually turned in my, my follow-up middle grade book. It's uh, going to be called Unfadeable, and it comes out next year, next spring. Um, but I was having some of my middle schoolers uh, sort of uh, critique it in process. And uh, I may have to rethink that as a, pro uh, as a, as a process because uh, they took far too much glee in having the opportunity to grade Mr. Broadus. Uh, and so, you know, they, oh, oh, man. Yeah, when the tables turned, they turned for real because all of a sudden it was a, they took out all the knives and was like, oh, Mr. Broadus, you need to just, you know, take out all these boring parts and all this kind of other stuff. So I'm like, oh, okay, this is, this is great. I, you're in all yeah. that you're, you're in middle school. Oh, yeah, it's middle school. And it's like, okay, I, I forgot where I was. My bad. <laughs> but by the way, your, um, your YA book, um, Steampunk Old History Novel, mm -hmm. has a rather interesting name for... Uh, a book. I, I was going. All right, I seen that. See that one on the shelves, and it's called well, uh, "Pimp My Airship." That's it. <laughs> yeah, that is a. Uh, so that's my uh, that's my steampunk novel. That uh, um, it's also been uh, getting me a bit of acclaim here here lately. So uh, so yeah. So I have the the middle grade series. That's that's Usual Suspects, and then uh, Unfadeable, and then. You know, in my adult realm, uh, un, uh, Pimp My Airship, 
uh, which is in the same universe as my other uh, steampunk book, uh, um, Buffalo Soldier. Yeah. So th those take place in the, in the same universe. And, uh, and, and yeah, that's uh, both of those. I tell my students, those are actually safe for them to read also, um, despite the title. Uh, that one, the, the, yeah, they're, they're safe for them to read too. <laughs> Did you get any pushback on that title from Tor by any chance? It's not a normal Tor title. They tend well, to go. You know what? Um, it actually right wasn't. Way. Yeah, my publisher didn't have a problem with it. It was actually the only time I've had pushback from it was there were a couple of review sites that said uh, we won't review anything with the word pimp in it. Uh, but <laughs> that was the only pushback I, I, I'd gotten. Obviously never worked on their cars in the 70s or 80s. So. Right, exactly, exactly. But, you know, I, I just rolled with it. It's like, okay, it's got pimp in the title. Uh, and, and frankly, it, it, uh, so it came from, uh, the sh I've written a short story called Pimp My Airship for uh, Apex Magazine back in uh, 2009. And so this is basically the novelization of that short story. It's just that, uh, you know, in, in the mean. Okay. Oh, what's that? I'll pull dick of you. Right, right. <laughs> in fact, speaking of following and Phil Dick's um, things, uh, Sorcerers was picked up by AMC. Yes. Um, so that's a so that's a completely different project. And that was a that pulled me out of things. Um, all of the normal track that I, I, I w of, of the things I was doing at the time. And so, so Sorcerers now. So Sorcerers is a is a project where I'm I'm basically working in collaboration with a, a with a writers room basically, and so it's me in a writers room. The writers room goes by uh, Otis Whitaker, so that's my co-author on, on that project, and, uh, <laughs> and uh, it's not my first time with the writers room. Uh, Clean writers room before you go on. What's that? What's a writers room for people who don't know the oh, term? Yeah, so writers room. It's basically when you have a, a, you know, in this case, about five or six writers, and we collaborate together to write the project. Um, and so it's, uh, in some ways, it's like survival of the fittest. You know, who, ha who has the best idea wins, and that's the idea that moves forward. Um, but it's, been, it's always a really interesting uh, collaborative process where, uh, it, it, uh, especially, I mean, especially coming as a, a as a novelist myself so you know i'm used to my idea wins at all times and then uh you know the to be god yes right exactly exactly uh but then well, to be thrown in... <laughs> right so so then to be thrown into a room where everybody is used to that <laughs> you know the a different sort of thing so you were saying then it got the you know, sorcerers is what now that put together by this group yeah, so it's a uh, it's a, a a novella, and uh, an, an an illustrated novella. So there's a comic book artist who came through and, and, and illustrated uh, much of the novella also, and uh, and it's basically about a, a young hip hop artist, uh, sort of a coming of age tale of a young hip hop artist who you know he's trying to figure out his life, trying to figure out uh, you know his next steps uh, in terms of how he fits in with his family, with his community, within the industry. Come to find out, he's also his family is a uh, part of a line of, uh, of of magic wielders, you know, as as happens. And so uh, then he's trying to figure out, oh, well, now what does this mean in terms of uh, what I'm supposed to do with the, with with my life? So um, this is uh, the the first chapter in in that tale. Uh, AMC picked it up, uh, optioned as a TV series. So uh, I'm, it's. Uh, it's been a long, interesting ride with this project, and it continues to take uh, odd turns. And I'm I am here for all of these turns. Are they going to let you do any writing for it? That's the hope. Uh, uh, that's that's the next 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 hurdle to clear. Is uh, see if I can uh, uh, get get into that writer's room uh, and uh, continue to give voice to these characters. Yeah, funny how they won't put that in the license, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, funny about that. <laughs> but I mean. That, that's sort of like the writer's journey. I mean, we're always fighting for control, fight, fighting for a voice of, of our own work. Uh, you know, it's a, a constant battle of rights. The, the, that's our, that's the journey. Yeah. Um, yes. Well, that's what editors are for, so we can thwart you. Right. <laughs> um, talk about working with other writers. I've, I've known you for, we Let's not do the math too hard. Don't do the math too hard. <laughs> uh, you didn't have any gray hair then. Let's put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> That's fair. 
I've always been gray. I think I was born that way at this point. But anyhow, um, talk about working with writers. I've no, people don't realize that down there, you're sort of like the organizer for the writing community in your your area in Indianapolis, which has become quite a hotbed. Yeah. How did that start, and what who, what are you up to now with it? Okay. So uh, it started. Oh man, speaking of gray hairs, goodness. Uh, this would have been uh, year 13 of me uh, organizing uh, what's called MoCon, which is, uh, you know, short for Maurice Convention. I've been to one. You have been to one, definitely. Uh, you were at what was supposed to be my last one. Yeah, I uh, celebrated the ending, didn't it? Right, die? right. And so, because that was, uh, what, when you were there, that was the, uh, our 10-year run. The 10-year, and it was the MoCon is over, we draped the MoCon and everything yep. else. How and, long did uh, that last? Look here, whatever. I know you called that shot even as <laughs> as it was going on. You're like, yeah, you know this is going to keep going, right? <laughs> yeah. um, I basically got one year off clean. Um, and then the next year there was, a, we'll just say, a public up upswell. And so I said, well, we won't do MoCon, but we can do what, what we'll call NoCon, which is, you know, my home will be open on this weekend. And, you know, if anyone wants to drop by, they can. <sighs> Then 40 to 50 writers descended on our house <laughs> that weekend. We should explain, MoCon is yeah. simply every writer who can drive in driving range shows up at your house and eats <laughs> too many sweets and a lot of pastries. Right, right. And, well, and, and feed a lot of mosquitoes. And, yeah. <laughs> and your, your small little uh, home gets uh, overrun rather badly. As overrun. I and we love it. Uh, because uh, the, the whole point was, because uh, my favorite part of a convention has always been the, you know, the, the late night room parties, the, the, the hanging out in the, the bar con. That's always been my favorite part of the convention. So I was like, what if we just did a convention that was just that? Um, and the room party would basically be at my house. And, uh, and let's just see how that goes. So, uh, but so yes, go ahead. The exciting part is what happens at it. Talk oh, about yeah. The interaction with, with when you put 50 writers in one place, what kind of things have come out of it? Oh, man, it's been great. I mean, I, I look back over our run, um, besides, you know, there have been uh, eight feet, people find their agents at this thing, people find publishers at this thing, because it, this is a, it's a relationship business. And when you throw, you know, publishers and agents and, and writers and just all these ideas start flowing, uh, you know, you never know what sort of magic's going to happen. Um, uh, my anthology series, uh, Dark Faith, came out of this. Um, because uh, part of MoCon has always been about, because uh, we would have like our, our day activities at a church and then the, the evening activities, you know, we'd have a, as a, the, like I said, at, at my house, um, because I, I like the idea of, of having uh, of, of faith issues being discussed among, among my, my writing community. Um, I love talking about these big ideas and, and, uh, and things that matter um, among creatives. And so Dark Faith came out of that. Uh, and, and the whole premise was, you know, let's write about faith, whatever that word means to you, from whatever perspective, whatever genre, um, and, and let's see what stories spin out of this. And so that's how uh, Dark Faith came out. Uh, and, and again, it came out of this, uh, um, out of this uh, weird little convention that uh, I was doing. Um, you've been, it, that's a reflection of the mentoring you've been doing for local authors and starting authors for two decades. Probably. <laughs> I don't. I, I hate measuring it in decades. We don't measure it in decades. Yeah, for for a, a lot of books that a lot of <laughs> right, right. What talk about what you do to to encourage other authors in the community? What would you advise authors who are watching to to do for their community that's been successful for you? Because you get quite a bit of recognition from it. Yeah. Um, well, for a start, it's just realizing that uh, you know we're not in competition with each other. Uh, you know, the success that I, I may have does not subtract from the success that you may have. And so with that in mind, how can we, how can we build together? How can we leverage, you know, what's going on over here with me to, to help you? Um, and that's another part aspect of, of MoCon, because uh, like a lot of my local writing community, where well, they don't get to go to different conventions. So I'm just like, well, what if I bring some of the folks who go to those conventions here? Um, uh, and so I'd bring in, you know, folks from around the country, uh, other writers and, and other publishers and, and, and like I said, editors and, and agents and bring them here so that, uh, you know, I'm basically I'm leveraging my social capital, you know, to benefit my, my local writing community also. 
and uh and so that that's paid off in, in a lot of dividends and, and i guess it's just this whole tradition like when i went to my first convention it was a world horror in 2002 um and the way i was welcomed into the community like i was like i, I like i was already at the table they were like oh yeah hey come on in uh and i was welcomed as an equal right off the bat um and 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 talked to as an equal right off the bat um, and that sort of amazing sort of camaraderie has been the thing I've tried to pass down or, or, or continue to pass along to um, the writing community here here in town. It's like, all right, no, we're on the same boat. So let's, uh, you know, let, let's get to the work of, of being writers. Yeah, it's certainly not a zero sum game. If nothing else, Harry Potter proved that by lifting the whole genres of right. uh, YA and fantasy and young adult. Um, and at the time, we all thought it was going to crush us. Right. Because they were printing so many, we couldn't get our books done. <laughs> right, when right. It settled, it was a much bigger pie. Oh, yeah. You grow the pie. That's the name of the game. It's like, it's like let's, let's not fight over a scrap. No, let's just grow the entire pie. And we do that by working together. And so uh, that's been the model I've, I've sort of operated by. And uh, and like I said, after you know taking a break from MoCon for a couple of years, we we brought it back. And we sort of doubled down on that idea. So it's like uh, I focused a, a lot more on what are some of the work I'm doing in the community. So so let me uh, bring in some of the community activists on top of it. Um, who are some of our local uh, artists um, that uh, um, uh, local visual artists? Now let me highlight them, and then um, uh, and then and then so Mokan I will also say also basically revolves around food. We eat a lot. I ain't gonna lie. We eat well during this thing. Um, and, got six pounds of gourmet jelly beans and they ate every single oh one. man we <laughs> How can you eat that much pectin i kept asking right uh, and so 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 we doubled down on that too so then we just brought in uh we start hiring uh, local uh catering businesses uh so we hired in local caterers to 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 uh basically feed us and uh oh and then we also uh, there's a local vintner uh who set up shop so now we don't even have to go anywhere we had wine brought in to us so uh so that's <laughs> that's been the last three years and now uh, <laughs> uh yeah, you know just just all these businesses working together that's good you mentioned activists uh, bringing in local community people mm -hmm. whom why what what happens when you do and well, are... um so I, I mentioned i'm the uh resident afrofuturist at uh at the kepper institute and uh, the Kepper Institute is a, a grassroots organization. It's all about uh, developing the next generation of, of young leaders. And, uh, and one of the ways we do that is by uh, using on, entrepreneurial uh, enterprises to uh, sort of train them in. So like we, uh, so it's a, basically a self-funded organization because uh, we would just start businesses, uh, if, uh, employ young people, not just as st not even as staff. It's like, no, no, you are running the business. So now, so you were, you were training on the spot and then the business uh, flo uh, flourishes and then we use that income to pay them and, and fund the organization, for example. Um, and then we, uh, and- uh, um, it's Sort of a lot of mentoring involved in that process. Oh, it is a nonstop mentor. I mean, it's, it, we, we say it's like, it's like school, except school is always on. Every, every moment is a, is a teaching moment. So it's nonstop mentoring. Um, and so, but there's a certain energy that comes with being act activists. So you have that on one side, but then there's a certain uh, energy that creatives bring um, in terms of how we tell stories and, and how stories re reflect the world and, and, and how the stories speak into the world. And so you, you, I guess I just love environments where you just throw in uh, creatives and, and have that energy just, just, just bubble up. And, and that's really reinforced the idea of what it means to, even for me as an Afrofuturist on staff, um, you know, what I, what I bring as a creative to, to the community work and what the community work then, how that informs my writing in, in a lot of ways too. So it's been, uh, it, it, I've realized it serves all of us by having that, that, that mix of, of energy in the room. So. Um, when you're mentoring someone who's involved in, in this, in the mm -hmm. community, mm -hmm. what, What's the common advice that you give? What are you teaching these new young entrepreneurs from your perspective? And I'm going to pivot that into the fact that you're a marketing machine. <laughs> okay. Um, well, for a start, 
I, I always keep coming back to, all right, hone your craft. I mean, I, I get it, you, you know, because like I'm working with, with uh, young hip hop artists, for example, or young uh, visual artists or, or uh, young entrepreneurs. And it always comes back to, all right, let's make sure you do, you know, it always comes back to the basics. Are you doing what you do at the highest level? And then what can we do to make sure that you are operating at the highest level just in, in, in your craft alone? So we always start there. Um, so we keep returning to this idea of honing your craft. Um, and then it becomes about, uh, you know, then it becomes mentoring, at, you know, at that point, you know, how, how can we do this better? What are some opportunities, you know, because I'm all about trial by fire. So it's like, hey, um, I, I had a, a student um, actually from my middle school, because after she graduated from the middle school, she reached out and said, hey, do you have any uh, interning opportunities with, uh, available? And I was like, well, let's, let's see what that looks like. So I had a conversation with her and her mom. And, and so uh, um, she said she was really interested in, in, uh, in developing her network, for example. And so I was like, all right, well, come on. Uh, you're going to hang out with me. We're going to go to Gen Con together. Um, and Gen Con is a convention that's local to me here in Indianapolis, it's, but it's one of the largest uh, gaming conventions in the country. And uh, the largest gaming convention in the country. Right. It's larger than anybody else. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> but, 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 but the writing exercise I had with her, though, I was just like, hey, you know what? Uh, anytime we're in a spot, I'm going to sit down, and your job is to learn to uh, uh, meet three new people, in, no matter what environment we're in. Your job is to learn, uh, meet three new people. You can't look them up in advance, but you have to meet them uh, and uh, and get to know them. And then the next day, when we get back together, you tell me. You, then you can research them and then report to me who you talk to. And so each day, you know, she would meet these people, and then the next day she'd come back and like, Mr. Broaddus, do you know who I was talking to? And I'm like, Yes, <laughs> yes, I do. Um, and then at the end of that time, it's like, and now, write me write me uh, an essay based on, on the experience. What, what did you learn? I need you to write me an essay on that. And so then she would write an essay and I'm like, no, 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 this isn't Mr. Broadus anymore. This is Maurice Broadus, editor at Apex Magazine. So you're gonna have to step your game up. And so then uh, we, we went through, I think I tore her essay to shreds five times and then returned it to her. Um, and, then I, and then it got to a shape, I'm like, oh wait, this is really good now. So then I said, hey, I'm going to hand this up to the editor in chief at Apex, see what he has to say. And then uh, so he the, but he texted me like, how hard should I be on her? I'm like, nope, rip her to shreds. So he you know, gave, made her do another round of edits. That, but then she wore through that like a champ. And then her essay got published. Mm -hmm. And so at, at Apex magazine. So I'm like, no, we this trial by fire. We will if you are, say you want to be in this game then you will be in it, but you will operate at our level. And so it, it's always about stepping your game up. We will provide opportunities for you, but you that, you have to be the one to take advantage of those opportunities. Yeah, you, you once used the phrase, no mercy around it, I believe. <laughs> right, right, no mercy. Something to do with a kid kicking. And <laughs> right. <laughs> but now to her credit, because she is now a junior in high school, she has three pro, she has three pro credits to her name at 16. Wow. Impressive. Yeah. Well done. Explain Apex Magazine in a couple sentences because we're referring to it a lot. Apex Magazine is one of the premier genre magazines, science fiction, fantasy, and horror. Um, it re it uh, just funded again because it went on hiatus for about, uh, for a couple years, but uh, we just did a Kickstarter to relaunch it. And the first issue of our relaunch comes out uh, in January 20, uh, 2021. And the URL just might happen to be if it came up and you wanted to plug it. Uh, it would be uh, apex-magazine.com. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay. Now, slipping along, uh, two, uh, two things hit me. You know, you're talking about the group together, and this is amazingly parallel to what Eric's done with the 1632 universe, mm -hmm. with the Ring of Fire universe, right. where it's broad, they're doing the gazettes and things and everything like that. Mm -hmm. um, other than the anthology, is there any thought of uh, Indiana, Central Indiana stories, or, or starting your own 1632 clone, perfectly <laughs> different topics since we would get cranky? <laughs> right, right. Well, you know, it's funny you say that because, I mean, with Pit My Airship, I mean, it is an, an alternate history version of Indianapolis. Um, and, and that being said, in that, uh, but Buffalo Soldiers in that universe, that's a novella, Step and Razor, 
is a novelette that came out in uh, Asimov's magazine. And all told, I have probably about 12 to 15 short stories that take place, that flesh out this, this uh, alternate history world of uh, Indianapolis. So I, I've quietly been uh, chugging along with this. Other than Indianapolis being important. <coughs> uh, <laughs> Yeah. Look, no, no, I'm not. Gonna, I'm not letting that slide. As as the creative, I get to decide that Indianapolis is going to be the center of this universe because reasons. <laughs> Down the street. Right. <laughs> what happened in history that changed? Um, for the, in this case, it was uh, America lost the Revolutionary War and uh, remains a, a colony of uh, of England. And so, uh, uh, and, and so that was the, the big divide in history. America is then, uh, as we know it, is basically three countries. It's uh, uh, the United States of uh, Albion, basically. Um, Texas is its own nation. And then the West Coast is, uh, the, is Native American uh, territory. Well, except for Native American, no change at all. Right. <laughs> <laughs> That they are their own sovereign territories. At I'm pretty sure they're independent as long as I've known anyone there. Right. Right. <laughs> All right. So, so let you, you know you. Let's see. I've known you since you were working in a warehouse and writing late at night when the kids fell asleep. Oh man. So, phrasing this carefully, let's see. You've got the usual suspects. Your Harper Collins novel has uh, just come out in paperback. In fact, hasn't it? Yep, just give me it's a junior library library girl selection, and you've gotten um, a bunch of uh, awards for things like Buffalo Soldiers and the Indiana Authors Award, mm -hmm. and all this, and AMC is after you for project. So, what have you done to make yourself such an overnight success? <laughs> <laughs> well, it only took twenty years to become an overnight success. You know how that goes. That's in George R. R. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> Um, you know, it, it's funny, Kyle, I was uh, actually just reflecting on, on, on all the uh, ac accidental marketing that I do. Um, cause, uh, part of my, part of my mentality has always been, well, you know what, my stories are my, are my marketing, uh, in that, you know, as I publish, you know, continue to publish short stories and continue to publish those short stories well, you know, they become, uh, ways that I can market myself. Um, and I can leverage those opportunities to, you know, pursue book deals. How? Huh? Um, so a short story comes out, for example, that gives me a chance to go across my social media platforms and uh, um, and, and broadcast. Hey, you, you, you know, okay, we'll take my last short story as a matter of fact. So uh, it's called the the Migration Suite, um, uh, a study in C, C sharp minor. Um, it got published in Uncanny Magazine. So as soon as it comes out, I can go, you know, tout. All right, I have a new story out. It's in Uncanny. Thus, I'm you know putting myself in front of potential readers again. Um, the fact that it's in Uncanny and Uncanny has its own marketing machine, I'm leveraging uh, their marketing machine to put my name uh, further out there. Um, and because I, because Uncanny is, a, is a, again, one of those premier uh, markets, well, that's a lot of eyeballs that, that can see the work. Uh, then, um, uh, as just found out a couple weeks ago, it, uh, that story got picked up uh, for a year's best anthology, which uh, that announcement alone uh, creates a, a new uh, buzz that I can now push uh, out there through my social media channels. And then once that book comes out, uh, their marketing pushes uh, uh, pushes things out again. So I have all, all the all these different uh, marketing opportunities that pop up because I sold a short story well. Never pass an opportunity. Never pass up an opportunity. <laughs> How does that work its way from getting a few new fans to Tor and Harper finding you over the last decade and you're being able to sell to? Well, it's, uh, so each short story I publish uh, forms my resume. And so, and like I said, I've had nearly 100 short stories published. That's a pretty decent resume. That's a lot of uh, stories being pushed out there uh, for people to see, which means when I go talk to a Harper Collins or when I go talk, talk to a Tor, I'm a known quantity to them. Uh, they know the level of work I'm, I'm capable of doing. And so, uh, and, and so that's how, you know, when they approached me for uh, my most recent novel series, because um, uh, I have a space opera trilogy coming out from tour starting in 2022. Um, it's called uh, All the Stars. Um, but again, it is because tour, I, I'm a known quantity. 
and uh, and they want and they want to be you know frankly they're like hey what are you up to what what are you working on we'll take it <laughs> you know yeah a lot of people don't realize it takes eighteen months to two years for a book to come out right right I mean it is a it is a process and when uh, we when we work on an anthology by the time it's out we're on volume three right <laughs> right by the time by the time book one uh, of all the stars and book one is called Sweep of Stars by the time that comes out. I will have had all, uh, all three books should have been written by the time uh, book one sees the light of day. One written? It's, Never yeah, mind. You yeah. know what I'm embarrassing for your editor. Right, right. <laughs> no, book, book one, one is not. So I, I, I am one now. Yes, and I'm waiting on my revision notes for book one, uh, but I have book two officially outlined, so I'm, I'm, I'm there. You've you got in a draft. That, that's impressive. Right, right. <laughs> People work for me, but anyhow. <laughs> um, so what is All the Stars about? The title doesn't give a direction very strongly. It's a nice title, but it doesn't tell me, you know, space, right. space, space possums with guns or whatever. Right. Um, well, it, it was pitched as a Black Panther meets The Expanse. <laughs> and that's the selling point right there. <laughs> you got to read it to figure out what you just said. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> well, um, it's a uh, uh, Black Panther meet the Expanse. How does it meet? Uh, please. Yeah, it's a. Uh, uh, it's basically it's a, a Pan Africanist uh, kingdom, intergalactic kingdom, uh, and so uh, so we we have this kingdom. It's set up, um, and so book one. Uh, follows uh, basically three storylines. So there's a there's a lot going on in this book. I ain't gonna lie. So you have the the machinations of uh, succession of, of what succession looks like within this uh, kingdom. You have uh, the adventures of a generation ship uh, as it's uh, exploring some territory, um, and then you have a, a, a space military unit that's uh, out uh, on the fringes of, of space, uh, discovering new life, and that all these storylines intertwine. <laughs> You are always, always are ambitious. I am ambitious, if nothing else. <laughs> so, to touch on the ethnic nature, mm -hmm. what sets this apart from your neighbor, net, your everyday space opera empire yeah. series that you might get from a, a Drake or a Ringo or a Heinlein? Right. Well, I mean, uh, for a start, there is that. Uh, uh, you can't really separate the two because the fact that uh, I, I've imagined uh, a future uh, with black people in space, that alone, <laughs> frankly, sets it apart from uh, uh, all of those named works. Um, and uh, and it's actually, uh, because world building is one of the things I, I love doing, it's given me the uh, opportunity to really dive deep into what world building could look like in, in this sort of scenario. And so I've probably spent a year and a half just uh, dreaming up uh, new ways of, of uh, living, uh, new economic systems, new education systems, uh, new governance styles, you know, just sitting around reimagining what all these could look like with it, within, this, uh, within this kingdom. A um, year, year, wait a minute, a year and a half? Your age is gonna so beat you up. You oh man. She... <laughs> Luckily, Maybe. luckily, I keep have I have the middle grade book out there, and so she's just like, all right, I, I distract her with the middle grade books. <laughs> so it's like, hey, I got that done. Um, you sound like Jody. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, I get get that uh, going. But then, uh, but then, like I said, but then tying it all back together, then it, it uh, it's interesting how that impacts my community work because you know I'm creating all these possible futures for the community, and then it's like, well, you know if if I imagine that they, these are how things could be, what could we be doing now to uh, take steps toward that future? And that's how I ended up being the uh, resident Afrofuturist uh, at, at the organization because, you know, I'm applying all these uh, principles of, of uh, science fiction and world building and future casting and then directly applying it to our community work. So it all keeps coming back together for me. Okay. Mm -hmm. On the... Um... You, on, on the success of this sell, selling the series to come out, mm -hmm. did you see, uh, 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 we both sell books into the community. Mm -hmm. I've been doing it for a little longer than you, but then I'm grayer and thinner too. <laughs> At least grayer, I'm starting to look up there. But anyhow, right, right. <laughs> well, hard to tell, good move. Um, 
seriously, did you think the, the massive success of Black Panther contributed to showing that uh, there was more market for this kind of story or what, what opened the market? Because it's very different from what I tried to sell 40 years ago and couldn't get anyone to buy. Right. Well, I mean, uh, actually, I can say that about uh, a couple things. So like when I wrote The Usual Suspects, for example, and The Usual Suspects follows the adventures of a uh, two young black boys as they try to, you know, uncover something that uh, happened at their school. They, they are the detectives in this, in this tale. Um, but I wrote that in, in 2012. And in 2012, that book was dead on arrival. Um, but in 2016, when my agent then take, retakes it out to market, well, now uh, the We Need Diverse Books movement has happened and, uh, and the, our, our own voices movement has happened. And so now the market has greatly sh uh, sh uh, shifted so, and, and opened up so that, you know, Usual Suspects sells uh, to Harper in like under two weeks. Um, and then uh, with, with Black Panther, Black Panther basically opened, it's not like, uh, there was no, there. It's not like there wasn't a black audience for science fiction and fantasy. <laughs> it's just that there was no product serving that audience, and so when uh, Black Panther comes comes along, uh, it opened the floodgates and and, and frankly uh, tore down a lot of barriers for you know. Like I said, I've been uh, you know this is like year twenty one for me as a professional author. Um, but all of a sudden it's like, oh, hey, turns out black people like science fiction. I'm like, hey, go figure. Uh, but, but now everybody's like, oh, wait, we need more. We, we want more of this sort of stuff. And so, yeah, so it's, it has, it's, it's, it's not so much that it uh, created a market as much as it revealed a market that was there. So. Created the market at the publisher level. Right, exactly. We're really willing to buy the stuff we've been pushing for 25 years. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Um, by the way, please tell me that, that, that the hero has an absolutely total powerful foxy sister like in Black Panther. I, I have a crush. I, oh, <laughs> oh, no, the, the hero is the, the sister in this series. Okay. <laughs> I've got all the comics. <laughs> Next, they just came out free. <laughs> all right. Marketing advice. Mm -hmm. You are one of the better people at grassroots and other marketing. You've talked about some of it. Um, an author, either a black author or just a young, young author of any sort trying to get started, mm -hmm. uh, black, Armenian, Irish, even, you know, no, forget the Irish. Anyhow, I'm sorry. I, I always quote Mel Brooks. <laughs> <laughs> or paraphrase in that case. What advice would you give to those new authors that, that has built you up to where you're now such a uh, overnight success after 20 years? Right, right. What should they be doing now? As they um, well, one of, I think one of the pivotal things that happened for me is, realize, is me centering on the idea of I write for me. So uh, I'm not chasing markets. I'm not... Um, it, 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 well, well, basically, that's it. I'm not chasing markets. I'm not writing to the fad. I'm not writing, uh, you know, I'm writing for what is on my heart, what I want, the story. I'm creating the stories I would like to read. And I, and I focus on that, um, which then gives me the luxury to go. So I write for me. That takes that pressure off. Now I publish to be read. And these are two distinct processes. Um, and, and, and by keeping my, and, and it helps me keep an eye on, on the ball. So, so I, I mean, published to be read. What makes what's different? So, uh, because uh, the, there is a, a temptation to take what once you've once you've written something, you so desperately want it to get out into the world. There's a temptation to take any which deal that comes along, and uh, and, and because I I separate the two, you know, I, I will take a story like Pimp My Airship, for example. I wrote that story, but I wrote that story for me. So once I wrote it, I put it away. And then I, I can wait now. And then I waited until the best deal came along and go, oh, wait, now this is an opportunity I, uh, that, that, that can serve both me and the publisher. All right, so I will go with this publisher. Um, and, and, and that's what I mean is, is uh, you, so when you, are, when you lose that edge of desperation, you don't just take any deal, you take the best deal, the one that, will, that you can leverage for the most opportunities. You wait. You wait. Um, and I know far too many people who don't wait and that they're in that rush to be published and it causes them to take deals that don't get them where they want to be. And so I wait and, and I wait for the best opportunity. 
And, uh, and while I'm waiting for that opportunity, I'm writing my next thing. So by the time I do publish uh, Pimp My Airship, well, I've got like, two more, I got two new novels in the can that are waiting uh, for the right opportunity. Um, and so once you get that train rolling, <laughs> you know, so all of a sudden I, it, it looks like I have this overnight success, but no, I have a series of things that I've waited on for the right moments and the right opportunities. Um, and then in the meantime, I focus on the things that I love doing. I love doing community work. Um, I love being on Twitter or Facebook, and but I'm only doing it for the uh, because I love them. I'm not doing them with my eye on be on, on marketing per se. You don't promote your books that much on your Facebook page, I've noticed. Right, uh, because uh, because I'm I'm not there for for that now. I, now, I, but I do I operate on Facebook through the lens of what would my family be interested in. So hey, I I recently won the Indiana Authors Award. Uh, my family would like to know that. So I, I will put I'll push that through uh, on Facebook. Hey, I had this TV Hopefully deal happen. Told your mother at least. I mean, come on. Okay, now that's that's actually the terrifying part of social media is uh, the fact that my mother is also on social media, and I never know what she's going to say on any of my posts. Um, which means also that if uh, you know if I stray with my language, for example, I know full well. I met your mother. Yes. Right. I will hear. I will hear about it. So. Uh, <laughs> so we've got a got a few minutes left. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What other? I I know one thing you're going to say because I've watched you and um, other than just the advice of keep writing, which you will give. Right. You know, because you, you you are one of those people who can't stop. I know. I've you watched. You are correct. <laughs> But other than other than when you finish, keep writing something else and keep going. What advice are you going to give to young men in your community or young men uh, around who want to get in, who might be a minority, might not be a minority, but want to become a writer with the success you're finding? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, it kind of comes down to what do you have to say, and uh, and, and by that I mean. Um, what what is your voice? Have you what? I mean, and that's the hardest thing to develop as a, as an artist, as a, as a creative, is to de, to uh, develop your own unique voice. Um, and so, so it comes back to that. What what is the thing that only you can say? What what is the story only you can tell? That's what's going to carve you out a unique space in in the canon of words. Because uh, in the end, what we're talking about is is the adding of of, of voices. And so. You know, how are you different? How are, what is it that you have to say that only you can say? Because that's actually what people want to hear. What is your personal story? What is that thing that lives closest in your heart? That's what, that's what we want. What inspired you to start writing in the 90s? Ooh, that's a good, you know, it, I think it's part, I think partly it's what you said earlier is like, I have, I always write. Um, I always have to, like, and, and when I say I write for me, I don't, I don't say that glibly. I mean, I am, uh, I use writing for, uh, as a way to process the world around me. I, you know, I'm processing my thoughts. I'm processing my feelings. I'm processing my faith. Uh, I'm processing my culture. Um, I, you know, I'm thinking through all these things and, and all of that comes through in, in my writing um, uh, as I, I bring all those things to, to the page. And so for me, I, I have to write the way people, or the way I have to breathe. It, it's a, it, it's, I have, I have these things inside of me. I have to get out. Um, I pro, as I'm processing, you know, like I said, my thoughts, my feelings. I just have to keep doing it. I literally just turned in a middle grade novel a week or so ago. I know I, I'm a week or two out from getting the revisions for, of my, uh, of my space opera. So that gives me like what two, three weeks. Uh, I'm writing a short story in that time. <laughs> uh, and, and, and then part of that is uh, I'm looking at the world around me and I'm like, well, um, what's on my heart right now? What's on my, what, what's, what's dominating my thoughts? And so, uh, and, and with that in mind, I have to get these words out of my head before, before the novel gets looked at. Before they explode out, yes. Yeah, oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> you spoke uh, of faith involving, your writing and faith. Yes. Were, do you run into any conflicts with 
pre with our the concepts of science fiction and fantasy, space opera, and faith, or does it integrate well? How do you integrate it? Um, actually, I think it. I honestly, I think it, it integrates well. Um, so uh, here in town, I actually sit on the board of the the Ray Bradbury Center, for example. Um, and and Ray Bradbury, he he. Uh, I know I looked at how, for example, he uh, integrated faith into several of his stories. Um, and, and that was one of those things I was just like, you know, because I'm a person of faith. I, I've grown up in the church. Um, uh, faith forms part of my worldview. And and, uh, and I think science fiction gives me a great way to talk about faith and, and issues of faith. Um, because, I mean, faith for me is, uh, you know, central to being human, uh, no matter what your faith is. Uh, mind you. Um, and so I get to ask some of those big questions and wrestle with those big questions, uh, you know, and, and those answers can look different, uh, depending on what story I'm trying to write. And so uh, uh, I uh, recently I had a, a short story, well, actually a, a novelette, it came out uh, at Beneath Cease of the Skies called uh, Ella's a Spaceship Melody. Um, and, but one of the one of the things I was wrestling with, well, besides the fact that I wanted to have an excuse to write a, about a starship that was powered by jazz music, because why not? Um, <laughs> so b besides that, um, just uh, lack of dilithium, <laughs> right? Exactly, exactly. Um, and so, but uh, but uh, one of the story, one of the subplots involves this AI. As AI becomes uh, self aware, would say would AI wrestle with ideas of faith, uh, with the idea of a soul, with the idea of uh, should I worship a creator? You know what what does that what does that mean? Um, so, you know, it, it, I don't know, it, for me, we wrestle with these big questions um, and, and science fiction gives me a, a great toolkit to wrestle with those questions. And so, I, for, so like I said, I think it integrates just fine because uh, I'm not there to, I'm not here to beat someone to, over the head with uh, ideas of faith or, or proselytizing or anything like that. No, I, I'm, I want to tell thoughtful stories. Um, and, and, and as I'm wrestling with these issues, uh, and I'm wrestling with what it means to be human, what it means to have a spirit or, or have a spiritual sense, uh, you know, I'm working it out on the page. Does the dealing with that and writing it can, and working with others, how does it affect the others around you in their faith mm -hmm. when they're working in the stories and writing with you? Yeah. And your faith, I know, is an integral part of what you do. Right. Um, well, a couple of different ways. So one, like I said, uh, doing the Dark Faith Project, for example, was great. Because uh, I, I think it was great for a, a, a couple of different ways. So one, I know people had one idea of what they thought I would m mean by integrating faith and, and works of horror and, and science fiction and, and fantasy. But, it, but then people saw, no. I need you to genuinely wrestle with it from your perspective. Um, yeah, you can be an atheist. What what does faith mean in your paradigm now? Um, you can be you can worship from any pantheon. I don't care. Uh, I I just want to see how you wrestle with these things. And I know how I wrestle with it. I want to see how you wrestle with it. Um, and then and so many people felt welcomed by that idea that I had I had a lot more stories. I think we had like over seven hundred submissions uh for that anthology because people felt so welcomed by you know, like no i'm not here to you know i'm not gatekeeping your faith i want to see how people wrestle with faith it can't be just me um what led to your atheism i want to know this uh you, you know that some of these writers are my friends it's like i want to know this about you you know it, it show me um uh and and so and i think having that level of trust and that level of openness uh allows me to work well with writers because they know I'm not there to judge them. They know I'm not there to uh, critique, you know, it's, for me, it's all about the story. So you get me to that story, I'm good. Okay. In the, first of all, I, I'm, I'm fighting the urge to not reach through the screen and go, you went, did an anthology and open submission. I warned you about that 15 years ago. I know. <laughs> I, I mean, you learn from my panic. <laughs> well, I, I, <laughs> yeah, I brought on a co-editor to help me out because, yeah, that happened. <laughs> at least the first time I did it, there was no internet. Now you can at least have a much broader secondary range and put some of them up. Yes, exactly. And, and we did some of that too. Yeah, it was it was great. Uh, so, uh, and, and those, 
uh, and then that too served as a as a form of marketing for the whole project too, because uh, then we have all it's like here are some sample stories of of, the, of what to expect in, in the anthology itself. So yeah, it all it all stacks on itself. Yes, and as I explained, marketing is integral to success. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Exactly. What what particular thing have you? What's you're you're getting more success? The market's changed. Mm -hmm. What, how have you changed that have made you more successful in the last five years than earlier periods? Mm. How's your writing changed? How have you changed? Um, well, I want to say, you know, 20 years in, I'm a better writer. So the, there, there, is, there is that. I, 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 I will go out on a limb and say I am a better writer now than I was, you know, 10, 20 years ago. Uh, so there, there is that. And, and I am aware of the market and how it changes and so you know which is it does that's the other thing about waiting um because like like right now i probably have a half dozen novels in my trunk right now perfectly sellable um but the market's not but the market's not there yet so but i have plenty of stuff to do i have plenty of stuff coming out so i have the luxury of waiting again um to where i see that shift so to so if the market shifts in any sort of certain way, that's like, oh, I have the pro perfect project for this moment now, and then I can I can put it out there. So I think there's a a, a level of savviness that has <laughs> come around uh, that has helped me navigate uh, an ever shifting market. Um, because I think part of it is you just have to stay nimble. You have to uh, be able to adapt quickly and and you have and, to think strategically. You have to think strategically. Um, and when I, when I was young, I was just throwing stuff out there and waiting for <laughs> waiting for stuff to stick. Uh, but now it's like, oh no, <laughs> uh, I, I can I can be much more strategic and get much more traction out of that. Okay, it is pretty much a wrap. Oh, Where yeah. can can someone who wants to find out more about you? Uh, what sites can they go to? Where should they look? Uh, if they want to see some of these books and, and wait for the six you've got hidden from us. Right, right. Well, uh, as far as branding goes, you can find me at Maurice Broadus. And so it's mauricebroadus.com or uh, on Facebook, it's Maurice Broadus. On Twitter, it's fake Maurice Broadus. On Instagram, it's Maurice Broadus. Two Ds. Two Ds. <laughs> the ever important two Ds and Broadus. <laughs> so. Okay. Well, thank you very much. We've enjoyed chatting. It's good to talk to you some more. Oh, Bill, it's always a great time chatting with you.